stoked to have you on, Eric. This is this yeah. Is exciting. I have uh, this is going to be podcast season for me because the past few months I've just been drowning in my business. It's it's the hardest part of business when you reach that like 100k mark, and you have to really focus on building out those systems. So there was a good two three months where I was just drowning in my business, and I really didn't have time for anything else. But now that we're kind of over that hump, I'm definitely keen to hop on more podcasts. That's awesome. How does that feel to be over that hump? It's a pretty big hump. Dude, it feels good. Um, yeah, there's there's that period of business growth where all of a sudden you're getting more orders than you ever have in the past. You don't have any fulfillment set up. You don't have any customer service set up. Um, for me in particular, we're all like manufacturing the product ourselves too. So uh, in terms of labor force, also getting the products actually manufactured. Uh, if you don't have any of that set up and you start to do volume of like 100, 150K, 200K a month, uh, you're going to be working in your business for 12 to 16 hours a day if you have no employees. So the biggest change for my business in the past few months has been systematizing everything. And when by the time we got to Tulum about two months ago, that's when all my systems were pretty much ironed out. And it's crazy the flip that you make as soon as you have those systems established because you go from working 12 to 16 hours a day to being able to walk away from your business for two days and still make money. So that's really the higher level sphere of business is when you build out those systems. Yeah, I definitely want to get into that. I, th I think that's, uh, I mean, I heard you talking about, and I think you put something up where you, you were hitting like 300K months in Q4, mm -hmm. which is just insane. And you, you're exactly right. I don't think that's, I don't, I don't even know if that'd be physically possible if you were still doing fulfillment yourself and things like that. I mean, that would be- 100%. Yeah, there's no <laughs> way it would be physically, physically possible. It wasn't physically possible at like 80K a month. But yeah. somehow I was still finding enough waking hours to go to the post office, pack every order, uh, answer customer support emails. But yeah, it, it, you're right. It wouldn't be physically possible at 200 plus K a month. You were cranking uh, the fulfillment at 80 K a month. How many Do orders you, is that? It's uh, I would say it was probably like a thousand to fifteen hundred orders a month. Um, but so it was August and I remember the first day that I hit 10 K in a day, I was at a music festival in Chicago and I had a couple of my buddies at my, that were going to my house to just go pack the inventory that I had already created into the mailers and ship them out. But I hit that 10 K day and it completely depleted me of inventory. And I was the, I was like a six hour plane flight away from my house. Yeah. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. Like I'm at this music festival trying to have fun. Just looking at my phone, I see yeah. this like 10K day on my Shopify. I was like, I'm so fucked when I get home. Like I, I am going to get home and I'm going to be working for like two, three, day, three days straight, just making inventory and getting everything out. Uh, so That's it's cool. like, it's definitely a glorious feeling when you hit that first 10K day. But at the same time, bro, like I was like, damn, this is going to be a shit ton of work. Yeah, well, I mean... There was, uh, I think Noah tweeted recently, you tweeted something and Noah responded, everybody wants an e-com brand, nobody wants an e-com company, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, there's certainly some validity in that. But I want to go back a little bit, man. I mean, we had a call, I don't know, a couple months ago, which was good to just to get to know you and stuff like that. But where did all this start? Like, what, what, how did you get to where you are from where you were, where you were being however far back you want to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll bring it back to the college days. Everyone asked me why Shilajit, why Shilajit is my first product. And I always knew it was going to be my first product. Back when I was in college, I actually, I, it's not a cool story at all, but I found <laughs> Shilajit through like an Instagram ad. Uh, yeah, like the most dramatic start to his story is me finding <laughs> Shilajit from an Instagram ad. But that's where I found it. I ended up buying from this company. It was during COVID, so I was really doing nothing else but going to the gym, self-improvement type journey. Um, I started taking Shilajit and I started seeing really cool results from it. I was like, wow, this is a really good supplement. I ended up being an affiliate for that company that I originally bought the product from. And I started putting all my college friends onto it. And by like all my college friends, I'm talking like 40, 50 people. Like I was so good at talking about the benefits of Shilajit. I was like, damn, this is going to be the first company that I start after college. So before based, before the inception of based, it was an idea in my head for like two years already. So I knew I was going to start a Shilajit company. Fast forward to when I graduated college, um, I got a job as a personal trainer, worked that job for a year while simultaneously growing the business. Earlier this year, or 
last year now, March 2023 is when I officially quit my job and the business was making more money than my uh, working income. So yeah, that's the journey of based from the inception. And so were, was there always this entrepreneurial spirit? Like, was that always the goal for you or was it, did it kind of just happen, happen upon that? Yeah, I've always had a sort of entrepreneurial spirit. I did start off with drop shipping back in like 2019. I remember the first time I ever made 13K in a month, I booked a one-way ticket to San Diego, balled out on all the money that I made, came back. <laughs> my Facebook ads stopped working, had no idea how to fix them. School started again, and then the store just died. So that was like my <laughs> first taste of like, it's possible to make internet money. Um, but at, at the time, I just wasn't smart enough to hold on to some cash reserves, maybe look a little bit more into how to operate my Facebook ads properly because the market died for my product. I literally had no idea how to revive it. And then after you ball out on your money, you have no, <laughs> you have no income to uh, experiment with new things. Yeah. But I think your point right there is actually pretty crucial. Like you got a taste of it. You're like, holy shit, I can make like 13 K in a month for somebody just doing drop shipping while in college is, is pretty serious, you know? And especially as you just mentioned, like it wasn't like you were doing deep dives. Um, so I think maybe that, that little taste of internet money is kind of what got you hooked. 100%. And it also raises the bar for you too. Once you see what's possible, see me making $13,000 in a month at 19 years old, all of a sudden the bar is at $13,000 a month. If I make anything less than that, I know that I'm operating below my potential. So I've always kind of had a chip on my shoulder in that sense where after I graduated college, I'm like, it's very, very possible for me to make at least 10 K a month. And again, that's like the new benchmark. And I still reach those benchmarks now in this higher level of business. I'll do like 400, for example, we did 400 K in November. That's the new benchmark. If I do anything less than 400 K in a month, then I know I'm not operating at my full potential. Um, Albeit it's a little bit different at this level with like systems building and stuff, but the principle is still the same. It's like you keep raising the bar for yourself. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, dude, also congrats on a 400K month. That's like insane. Because how long has Base been around? Uh, we launched the Shopify store August 2022. So it's been about a year and a half or a full year and a half now. Well, so think of August 2022 to November 2023 is what, like four, 15, 16 months? That's from zero to 400 K month. That's pretty wild, dude. So, I mean, that speaks to you and your work ethic also to the brand, um, mm -hmm. which I definitely want to get into like the strength of the brand. Cause it is very strong. I also I'm out right now, but base chillage I've been probably since June, I've been using that regularly. I got my brother on it, got my parents on it sometimes, but I love the product, love the brand, but that's, that's actually what I want to get into next is like the, the brand, like how, how have you gone around? How have you gone about or focused on building a quality brand because that's really what based is. It's, it's more than just Shilajit. It's like an actual brand. Yeah. The thing with brands is that you're not really selling a product. You're conveying an emotion to an audience that relates to what your brand stands behind. And that's the principle behind a lot of these successful e-commerce brands is that they're not more so focused on telling you the benefits of why Shilajit is good. They're giving you a storyline. They're giving you something to believe in. And if you look at any of our sales channels, Instagram, Twitter, um, we're always conveying a message there and it's never just direct response. It's never just, hey, we're a Shilajit company, here's 20% off, buy it because we're the highest quality. You're not going to set yourself apart that way. You have to set yourself apart in a sense where you're actually conveying some sort of message to your audience that they could relate to and get behind. Um, so yeah, that's really the concept of building like a strong brand how how have you like implemented that just like in ads is there just like a certain messaging that you want to portray or certain values or utilizing certain affiliates that have all like because obviously if, if it's an affiliate they'll have their own audience and that that affiliate will have that uh will convey a certain message to that audience so is it choosing affiliates wisely like how, how do you implement that into the actual brand strategy yeah it's all about the trust built behind the affiliates that promote the brand definitely um, but it, it goes down even to the nitty gritty, like the colors that you use, the color grading that you use, the edits that you put on the tweet overlays, like you see in our Instagram feed, it's always like Menser or Arnold, people that convey emotions to people, people 
these big guys that have super loud uh, physiques that communicate something to the audience. That's awesome. No, and I, it's funny too. I don't know if it's just because I follow like you and Vance and knowing all those guys or I take show legit, but I, I've been starting to see a lot more based ads, which I think is cool. It's, it's cool to see like, um, like the Vance and no ads. I don't know. I just think it's cool to just see that pop up as an ad. Um, mm -hmm. what, what actually is Sheila I know it's like from the Himalayans. I actually really don't know much about it to be honest, but I know it's like, for, like a, a compound from the Himalayans or something. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually a byproduct of a process called humidification, which is the decomposition of plant matter over thousands of years. You could find shilajit in multiple different mountain regions in the world uh, around the Himalayans, which is the most popular, which is what most of the companies on the market that are saturated in the market now are getting it from the Himalayas. Uh, and then there's also other regions like the Altai, where we get ours from. There's also a lot of US-based shilajit companies coming out because you're able to harvest a similar type substance from the higher elevations of the Rocky Mountains and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've lab tested every single supply or major supply chain in the world. And that's how I got the brand off the ground. And for every single supply chain that I tested, whether it's like from Nepal, Himalayas, India, um, Altai, Altai always came out on top in terms of potency of the product and cleanliness of the product. The Altai supplier that we work with uses modern purification methods to make sure that there's no impurities in the product at all, making sure that the heavy metal content is way below the recommended uh, daily allowance of them. And the fulvic acid percentage, which is the active ingredient in shilajit where most of the benefits come from, is always the highest in the Altai region. So that's why Base ended up going with Altai from, for their sourcing. And you mentioned the heavy metals. That's that's a concern with, with shilajit companies is like the, you said recommended allowance, and it's kind of like, well, how much of a poison is is good i guess so you're exactly right like i i have zero interest in getting the recommended daily allowance of heavy metals i want it to be as low as possible so is that like a concern with most shilajit companies yeah i said recommended daily allowance it's more so like the highest permissible level because you're there's no yeah. really like allowance that you're you want of heavy metals in your body so it's not to exceed a permissible level uh and there, there's a separate permissible level for supplements than there is for like food and stuff but for natural products, no matter if it's shilajit, pine pollen too, uh, which is the other product that we just released recently, anything that's coming from the earth is going to have a trace amount of heavy metal content in it because it's a natural product. The point with shilajit is it's a lot of it is contaminated with higher level of heavy metals because of where it's sourced from. The purification methods that they use, the popular one for Himalayan is sun-dried, which in my opinion, is not a very sanitary way of purifying the shilajit. Um, and also the environments where it comes from. If it comes from an environment where it's super close to, say, like a city that has a lot of uh, pollution going over to the mountains, whether it's like air pollution, water pollution and such, if that contaminates the, shil the veins of shilajit that they harvest from, there's going to be higher levels of heavy metal content in there. So I always lab test the Altai to make sure we also have a partnership with a local lab testing facility out in Russia where we source it from. So they always do source testing. We always do US-based testing and we always ensure that the base products are super clean. Yeah, that's awesome. That's I think that's one of the ways to like separate yourself. And as you mentioned, it's the market's not, I, I don't know if it's saturated, but there's definitely a lot of shilajit companies now that... Uh, mm -hmm that are coming to be. And I don't think a lot of them do that. And I think they're kind of just trying to scrape crumbs. Whereas this is the difference I think in based and other companies as well, but this is a specific example of being a brand as opposed to a product. Like these companies are just trying to shill a product. Whereas you're trying to build an actual brand, which is going to equate to more trust and ultimately more revenue and more positive impact in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. You said uh, scraping for crumbs and that's the perfect way to put it. You can't really compete with the guy, the big guys on Facebook ads who are spending a lot of money on very reputable looking ads. And that's where the affiliates come in. That's where the testimonial creatives come in. People can't replicate those to an extent where they could really build trust with their customers. All of these Shilajit companies that are looking through Facebook ad li library and seeing that Shilajit is a working product for me and a few other bigger companies. Um, 
what they're doing is really scraping crumbs because all they could do is promote a product. They don't have the trust built behind the brand. They don't have the real life testimonials coming from Twitter. They don't have real life testimonials coming from Instagram and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's really hard to replicate a real brand in like a few days trying to just compete with people on Facebook ad library. It takes a lot of time to build a real brand and a lot of dedication. Uh, it's definitely a time investment, but it's way worth it down the road because like you said, again, a lot more trust, but with customers, lifetime value, a lot higher with brands. And I mean, in the future, if we ever were to exit the company, a lot of brand equity as well. That's a great point. I never thought about that because if, if it's just like, like I said, shilling products, there's no, like no lifetime value. There's not going to be a lot of, uh, what's the word? Not a lot of incentive for somebody that's trying to buy it. And then you as the, as the owner would not get that exit that you want because there isn't that lasting brand equity. You, you mentioned like the actual, uh, shill legit active compound. You said fulvic acid is what it is. Mm -hmm. What exactly is fulvic acid? And I heard you on a podcast, um, that I was listening to, or you're talking about how companies will say like 79 active minerals or whatever. And you're kind of like, that's really not the, where the benefit comes from. So if you want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Shilajit itself does have a lot of trace minerals and it's very commonly regurgitated copy that a lot of these new companies are using that it has 87 minerals, 89 minerals, 92 minerals. It's funny because they never, the number is never the same, but yeah. it's really just regurgitated copy that means nothing. Shilajit is a good source of a few different minerals for sure, but the real main benefits that come from Shilajit is the fulvic and humic acid content in it because those are where the real benefits come from in terms of allowing your cells to uptake more nutrients from your food, um, stimulating the hormones in your hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, which is the luteinizing hormone and your follicle stimulating hormone that helps the balance of hormones between both men and women. Um, the real benefits are really coming from the fulvic acid and not the mineral content. And so that's why you're looking at the Altai predominantly, because you said the fulvic acid's the highest? Fulvic acid always trumps in the Altai region. It's always the highest. And it's just so consistent that it's my favorite trilogy for sure. Right on. And then we talked a little bit about, I mean, we touched on pine pollen. I'm, ex I'm super stoked. I got some of that. I think it's being delivered, I don't know, a couple of days or so. So I'm stoked on that. What's uh, what's the story behind that? And why'd you choose that as your second product? Because that's a that's a big step, I feel like, because y'all y'all have been based supplements and you've been known for your Shilajit for since y'all were incepted. But now you're kind of taking that step out. So that's a big step to to uh, to take as a brand. Why, why'd you choose pine pollen as the as the second product? Like I said before, I always knew Shilajit was going to be the first product. I always knew Pine Pollen was going to be the second product too. If any of my college friends would watch this podcast, they would be like, yep, Shilajit and Pine Pollen because that's all I talked about in college. So I found Shilajit uh, through like an Instagram ad and then Pine Pollen. I, I actually don't remember how I discovered Pine Pollen, but when I started cycling it for the first time, bro, the effects of the Pine Pollen were so profound that I was like, this is going to be the second product when I released one. Uh, at the time, I was taking a Chinese-based pine pollen, which I saw a lot of their supply chain activity, and it's actually really horrific. Um, so I definitely do not want to source any Chinese pine pollen. They literally mass harvest it, and they keep it in these big warehouse rooms where it's just hills of pine pollen. So unsanitary. <laughs> they send me pictures of it. I'm like, why would you guys send me pictures of this? This is disgusting. So... Chinese pine pollen is the first stuff that I took. Did feel definitely some profound effects, but in terms of having a supply chain that builds trust with people, again, in the sense of building a brand, I want to be super transparent of where ours comes from. So I experimented with a lot of different pine pollen strains. We have Lodgepole, um, Ponderosa, which are two Canadian-based ones. And then the one that we ended up going with is the Jack Pine species. So the Jack Pine species is known for being a super rugged plant that uh, is in super rugged and harsh environments. And those environments tend to have plants with a lot more nutritional content. Uh, so we experimented with Jack Pine tincture maceration, and I tried it with a 95% ethanol-based solution, which extracts most of the steroid hormones from the pine pollen itself. And it is jet fuel. <laughs> I'm excited for you to try it and get back to me, but yeah, 
that stuff is powerful. It is an absolute banger. I'm actually macerating some right behind me. I'll take you here. What, yeah, what is that? What is it? What does that even mean? So macerating is when you soak it in solution. So this oh, wow. is Oh wow. So that's the pine pollen at the bottom. Yeah. So this is like an alcohol solution here. And then the dual extraction that we do. Obviously, this is just like a kitchen project for me. This is not what I sell, but it's yeah. like a <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> yeah. buddy's out here making it in like old milk jars. That's awesome. Yeah. No, the, uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a little nerd with the uh, pine pollen texture maceration now. Well, yeah, there's, I actually really want to get into a lot of that because um, that I'm fascinated by that, but I, I kind of want to take a step back. So shilajit and pine pollen in college, that's pretty esoteric. So I'm curious now that you say that, like what got you started on on that sort of esoteric wave because I don't, I, I was pretty tapped in guy played baseball in college. So I was pretty tapped into like health and, and sort of different modalities of training and things like that and different supplements. But I had never heard of those two things until like pretty recently. So like, what were you, what was the impetus of that? Like esoteric health enthusiasm? I think it was probably just a natural inclination for me. I never really vibed so much with the mainstream supplementation wave of like gym goers whether it's like whey protein powder. One thing that I actually did experiment with for a while is pea protein powder at the time, which I thought was good for me. And then I look back, I'm like, that definitely was just nuking my gut lining. Uh, but yeah, I was more driven towards like hormonal health than a lot of the guys who focus on bulking. They're always just like calories in, calories in. I don't care where they're coming from. Uh, but I always saw the most benefit when I took care of my hormones. And when I was researching shilajit and pine pollen, obviously they have such a profound effect on your hormones that you're putting in, even if you put in like half the work that these guys are putting in that are just treating their bodies like shit, you're going to see better results than them. And the first time, like I said, when I cycled pine pollen, the, pro the effects were so profound that I was like, there's just no other better way to approach life. Like this esoteric health wave is definitely the best way to go about whatever you're doing, whether it's just general health or trying to get bigger in the gym. I remember the first time that I was cycling pine pollen and the first time that I was mega dosing shilajit, uh, <laughs> I literally was PRing on my bench every other time I was working out. I was like, this is, this is unreal. Why doesn't everyone do this? And that, that's really my driver to making my company. It's like, why doesn't everyone do this? These are literally cheat codes. And yeah. It, it's cool to look back like that was always the vision and now we just have such solid supply chains built for both of these products uh, it's really just the vision unfolding like looking back like two years ago that's that's cool to hear i mean there's a there's a lyric to a song it's like I, I saw what do you say something along the lines of like i seen this twice i saw it first in my head so that's cool to hear that you, you the vision is unfolding as as you intended but the uh the thing that I think about with regards to like supplementation and things like pine pollen, because some people might be like, well, why do you even need pine pollen? Or why do you need shilajit? Or why do you need creatine or L-carnitine or whatever the hell, or TRT for that matter? My buddy told me this one time and I've never forgot it. It was actually when I was thinking about taking in, uh, methylene blue for the first time, because I'm like, ah, oh, it's a synthetic compound. I don't know. And he was kind of like, dude, you've been inundated for your entire life with things that are destroying your health that are synthetic or that are like not synthetic why don't you at least be open to something that's maybe synthetic or maybe not uh, something that I would consume on a regular basis. That's actually good for your health. Cause if mm -hmm. you think about it, like we've been exposed to toxins since the day we were born, which all fuck up our hormones. And as you mentioned, like hormone health is really like pretty much health in, in general. You can't, have, you cannot be healthy. Definitely. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's definitely paramount. I am obsessed with the idea that hormones are some of the most important molecules for us feeling the way that we do, how we perceive the world, how your overall health is operating. So yeah, hormones are definitely paramount. Uh, in terms of methylene blue, I love methylene blue. It is actually one of my favorite supplements. And I know you've seen some crazy results with the Meraki Moo. I always see the before and after pictures of uh, Vance's product. Yeah. Dude, it's wild. I, I like... I, 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 I do have an affiliate code for them, but like I really don't even care if like people want to go buy it right now. That That is literally the only thing that touches my skin except Aleppo soap which is three ingredients like and and that the turnaround you're talking about I don't know what the hell topical MB does but it was pretty incredible that was the worst breakout of my life on my forehead and then I actually like right now have a pimple it's like the first pimple I've gotten in like three or four months and I, that's yeah. as long as I've been using it 
No, your skin definitely is glowing. You definitely look good. Uh, Dude, it's the, the Meraki uh, Moo. The Meraki. the Meraki Moo is an incredible product. I remember the first time that I tried it, I was putting it on my skin for like two weeks and I actually felt like my skin was tighter. Like yeah. you could physically feel like the difference in skin elasticity, which is crazy. Uh, another compound that I started experimenting with for skin health is the GHK copper peptide uh, from the Mira skin one. That is definitely, heard of that. definitely a good product as well. You could feel the skin elasticity and the skin elasticity change when you use products like those. And it's crazy because people go years and years searching for the perfect skin product that's going to take away their breakouts. But it's these esoteric products that you, you're you going to yeah. find nowhere else but our Twitter sphere that are ones that actually work. Yeah, which is fascinating. And I, I even specifically for women, because I mean, obviously women get bombarded by this, like just totally false. It, it's it's literally just a money grab, the, the personal hygiene uh, industry for women. It's like, I, I was looking at something my mom bought relatively recently, and there must have been 40 fucking ingredients all ingredients that I could not pronounce for this like face moisturizer. I'm like, mom, do you know what I put on my skin? I put on fucking beef tallow and m- literally blue dye. Yeah. yeah. And, and she's like, well, and blue dye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just interesting how that happens. It's, it's, it kind of goes back to the, the proverbial idea of like less is more in, in almost every single case. And I totally agree with you. I think that, um, methylene blue now, I mean, I've been taking methylene blue for Honestly, I started taking MB and Shilajit around the same time this summer, and I love both. One of the things I like about Shilajit, um, it kind of became like a little uh, like a ritual with my brother. I was living with him in Austin for a while, and we would just wake up, have some Shilajit in, in, in some warm water and chill for a second. It was kind of like our morning routine with the red lights on, and it was actually like, there you go. Cheers. Um, it was just, It's just cool. I like waking up with a warm drink, and obviously, if there's benefits as well, then it's even better. But I want to go back to pine pollen because I know you can take a powder, right? It can't you take mm. pine pollen just a straight powder, but you you're selling it in a tincture. Why why is that? Yeah, so for the hormonal benefits of pine pollen, you're going to get the most benefits out of having a tincture that you consume sublingually. The reason behind that is that we macerate it like we do with the glycerin and alcohol, and it extracts all of the beneficial compounds into solution. And instead of having your gut or instead of having it in your stomach where your stomach acid is going to destroy a lot of those beneficial compounds, it goes straight to the bloodstream through your tongue. So a lot of companies use 40% alcohol by volume uh, for their solutions. And there's actually studies out on the internet where you could read that the solubility of steroid molecules increases about 50 fold from a 40% alcohol solution to what we use is a 95% alcohol solution. So with the 95% alcohol solution, you're getting pretty much all of those phytoandrogens, all of that bioavailable identical uh, testosterone from the pine pollen, and it goes straight to your bloodstream. So that's why the tincture version, that's why our tincture version in particular is the best on the market, because we use the highest alcohol volume and also the sublingual principle of having it go straight to your bloodstream instead of having your stomach destroy all of the beneficial compounds. Yeah. And then it's just like expensive pee at that point. Um, yeah. <laughs> what's exactly. oh, um, You said phytoandrogens. Androgens. What exactly is a phytoandrogen? So phytoandrogens is a blanket term for a lot of different compounds. A lot of them are germination compounds, uh, which are hormones that are responsible for when plants mate. The germination is for the rapid uh, cell, uh, rapid cell division that allows the plant to grow super, super fast. So the ways that those interact with humans, they interact very similarly with our own steroid molecules, including like testosterone, uh, and all the other derivatives. So phytoandrogens are a way to help your body click back into that testosterone dominance. If, especially if you're like an estrogen dominant man, um, so yeah, they, they interact super simi- similarly to our own human steroid molecules. And I've heard you say this, but you, you recommend uh, cycling pine pollen, correct? Yeah, any sort of endogenous source of hormones that you're putting into your body, if you take it long enough, you're going to see a little decrease in your own uh, endogenous production. So I always recommend cycling pine pollen, especially with something as strong as the base tincture. 
I would definitely, definitely do five days on two days off. And if you're cycle, if you plan to be on it for a long time, say like multiple months throughout the year, I would definitely take like two months off at a time if you're taking it for three to four months. So, I mean, it's not anything significant like you would get from hopping off like TRT, for example. Yeah. You might see a slight decrease in libido if you're on it for, say, four or five months straight without taking any days off. But you're always going to bounce back because it's not like a super, super potent source of exogenous hormones. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, we, I was talking to Noah about this, about cycling everything, like even life, like literally everything in life just cycle. And I think that's just a, that's a good principle, in my opinion, to live by in general. It doesn't matter if it's pine pollen, chill, legit, create, like what, name the supplement, name the, the training modality, name the focus of, of your training or the focus of your studies or whatever it is. I think it's just good to cycle in general for like the exact same reason, because if you, if you don't cycle, then your body is very good at adapting and over a long enough time horizon, it will just be like, Oh, well, shit, I don't need to do this. So I won't anymore. And then you'll have that drop off that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's exciting though, dude. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pumped to, I'm pumped to, to try that stuff. Cause I mean, I've heard, I've literally never, I haven't heard, I mean, base bra is another one who, uh, he told me that he's taken it before you Vance, all these guys. I mean, I haven't heard anybody say a bad thing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm excited for all the reviews to start coming out. I want to bounce back to the idea of cycling everything in life, because that's something that I've actually been talking about a lot recently between Twitter and I have my Instagram broadcast channel now. The principle of always breaking the pattern, no matter what you're doing every day, patterns kill creativity. And you said your body is really good at adapting. Your physical body is really good at adapting to things. Well, so is your brain. Patterns, your brain is going to adapt to, find those uh, routines that make it easier for your brain to go through everyday life. And you won't give yourself that opportunity to have those creative thoughts if you're always doing the same thing. So the principle of cycling everything, the principle of always interrupting the pattern in your life is so important to me because it allows more creativity to flow throughout. Yeah, absolutely. And an example for you is obviously you and, and Noah, Newt Bro, and, and all those guys going down to Mexico and like that pattern interrupt, um, for example. Why, why don't you speak on that? A how was that spending, however, would y'all spend a month down there? Yeah, we spent a month down there. And honestly, I did not want to leave that at the end of the trip. It felt like home. We were so hyper productive there that, I mean, we call it a pattern interrupter, but I interrupted the pattern in the very best way possible. I left, I left Tulum in November, 400 grand, like in the month, like it's crazy. Yeah. We were just sitting at the kitchen table, uh, synergizing how we're going to launch the pine pond. And then we launched it, sold out the product in literally no time, uh, so yeah, breaking the pattern super important. Tulum was a fun trip. We got a lot done uh, simultaneously, had the most fun that I probably had this year. Um, so yeah, in terms of pattern interrupters, that was probably the most enjoyable one of my life this this year for sure. That's awesome. That's good to hear. I mean, even like the, just the content and stuff that y'all were posting, was it was cool to see because I think that's like, a, that's a goal of mine in terms of we talked about it maybe before we were live, I don't even remember, but just the idea of like being around people that are on the same mission or at least on the, on the same, in the same direction, walking the same general direction as you with the same sort of drive and goals. Like it, there's really no, uh, my buddy Zach Shankin says the way you get quantum leaps, which November for you is absolutely a quantum leap. The way you get quantum leaps is through people. There's no other way around it. Like you cannot have a quantum leap by yourself. You have to do it through accessing the experience, intelligence and, and wisdom of other people in connection with other people. So I think that's just like, if, I just can't imagine a better way to like 10 X your output in life than being around a bunch of your bros that are also trying to 10 X your output in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, and when I look back to November, I could have sat at my kitchen table like I do now, just doing the same work. And I could have been working eight to 10 hours a day, but I don't think I would have got the same results if I was, I, I don't think I would have got the same results here that I did in Tulum, working half the time and half the time working, just being surrounded by people that are synergizing so effectively with you, people that have such great creative ideas, people that are also doing things themselves. is just such a recipe for a quantum leap. The month before in October, I think we did 220K and that was a crazy month for me at the time. 
220k i was like holy yeah. shit like this it's it's gotta it's gotta be up soon like the, the business can't keep growing like this the month after we almost doubled our revenue and the reason we almost doubled the revenue is because i put myself in an environment where we're synergizing with so many different ideas so many different ways to approach launching this new product i could have launched this product from my kitchen table and probably done half as well compared to if i was in tulum synergizing with yeah. some of the greatest minds that i've ever been around so it, it just puts everything into perspective like you could frame it as hey i'm working like super hard eight to ten hours a day but you're at your kitchen table bro you need to interrupt the pattern in some sort of way give yourself to give yourself the opportunity to have those creative ideas come to life yeah and i think hormozy talks about this a lot i mean a lot of people talk about it but in me and Noah actually most of our first conversation on the podcast like a couple months ago was about this the idea that environment um like the importance of environment and how we talk about patterns, how habits are really just patterns of, of thought or habit uh, patterns of, of doing, which are almost 100% of the time primed by the environment that we're in. It's like if you're in a specific environment, you're going to act accordingly to that environment. So if you want to change a habit or make a new habit or break a bad habit, the best way to do that that I've found in my life, which by no means am I perfect at doing this, is to switch the environment like as drastically as I can, because then you have like a new environment with new triggers and new primes. Um, and, and I think I, I remember seeing you tweet something about that where you're like, when you come, when you come back to your hometown, something like your creativity tanks or something. Mm -hmm. Dude, because your hometown so is the ultimate, is the ultimate like ingrained pattern in your brain. I'm in the house that I grew up in. I'm going to the same gym that I've been going to for five years. I'm driving in the, down the same streets that I was driving to when I went to high school. It's like all of these things, whether you notice it or not, have this unconscious, effect on your mind where it puts you into this pattern mode because you're so used to all your surroundings. And that's why I like traveling so much because I'll go to Austin, for example, I went to Austin back in October and I was able to get so much done there. Like my productivity was so much higher. Everything around me is super novel. So you're just getting all of this new input and you get so many more ideas when you're in an environment that you've never been in. Same thing for Florida last week. It's like, I'm in an environment that I've never been in. We're talking about new things. We're figuring out new ideas, synergizing. It's like environment is really everything. And then I go back to my hometown. Like I am now, it's like, I'm still working hard, but I definitely feel like I'm in a pattern and I can't stay here forever. I need to get out. And that's why making the move to Florida in two months. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, I, I was going to ask like, how do you balance that? Because I'm, I'm um, getting ready to move to Austin full time here and like, a month or so depending on some things but um the whole the whole year of 2023 I, like I, I lived in atlanta first then tampa for a, a month and a half then atlanta again then austin then atlanta then austin then atlanta again and it was i always found like like every single change when i left atlanta which is where i was born and raised i felt better i was more productive i was more creative i i went harder in the gym i, I like literally my life just like multiplied every time I left Atlanta. So my question to you is like, how do you balance the, the desire? Cause obviously you're with your family and you're, you're, you're with your hometown friends, if that's the case. And you're, you're, um, it's nice to be home, but like, how do you balance that with, with that desire to go be in a novel environment? Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time with my friends and family here, make sure that you let them know that they're appreciated and that they're definitely a huge part of your life. But if anyone is truly, if anyone truly loves you and if anyone truly wants the best for you, they're going to let you do what's best for yourself. And for me right now, this point in my life is traveling, meeting new people, growing my business. And part of growing my business is getting myself out there, talking to new people, studying, like being away. So like you'll definitely lose a lot of friends um, when you start going more, leaning into your dreams, but it'll really give you the people that are truly meant to be in your life and the people that are still going to be here when you come back home. So that's, what's important to me. It's like, when I come back home, all of the friends, all my true friends are super excited to see me and I'll spend time with them and let them know that like, Hey, like I'm still the same person I was before I left, but like, this is part of who I am now. This is part of my mission. And I'm going to spend like a month or two away. Uh, Florida now is going to be like at least six months, but yeah, yeah it's a, uh, it's definitely a big shift in life and you're kind of, you're almost like leaving your old self behind in the past, but it, it's the most glorious thing ever. 
Like you never want to be the same person. I, I said this in my broadcast channel the other day. It's like, if you're not a completely unrecognizable person, every time you come back home in three months, every three to six months, then you're not growing fast enough. You have to be putting yourself into such radically different environments that you change down to like your physiognomy. Like physiognomy, yeah. like you're, you will change if you put yourself into a new environment where you are so un, not used to being. And it's, it's cool because I look at pictures of myself in Mexico and by the end of that trip, you could see a physiognomy change in me. I hadn't been that lean in so long. My skin was so clear. My gaze was so focused because we were so focused on that trip. Um, then I went straight back from, after I left Mexico, I went straight to Ireland, bro. The climate was so different. Yeah. Uh, it could not be more different. <laughs> yeah. It could not be more different than Mexico. Uh, it was rainy, it was cold. And then from Ireland, I went back home for a little while. And then you could see like my physiognomy change uh, compared, like even looking at myself in the camera right now, like I look like a different person than I was in Tulum. And it all has to do with what the patterns are where you are and like what you're doing uh, at the location where you are. It's uh, it's crazy how you, how your mind and your body change so fast. Well, the obviously we're not we're not hogs we're not pigs but you saw that tweet i think case bradford tweeted it with the hogs mm -hmm. um and me and no touched on this a little bit but i'm i'm i i've hunted hogs for the last 10 years of my life uh in central georgia and like part of the reason that hogs are such a problem in america is is literally that picture it's that a domesticated hog doesn't go into the wild and just stay a domesticated fat lazy hog like it literally evolves to the environment and obviously as i mentioned we're not hogs as you can tell but we I think there's a, there's a, there's a, like, there's a sense of that. Like we adapt human beings are, that's why we've been the most successful species in the history of the universe. Like in terms of like propagation and, and growing as a, uh, as a species, but we can adapt so much. So the environment that you put yourself in is, is so crucial. And I think you're exactly right. Like going from Mexico to Ireland, why would your body not adapt? It would be bad if your body didn't actually, because then you'd be mm -hmm. really tan. You wouldn't be able to, uh, um, absorb as much vitamin D, you'd be less healthy, all these different things. So it's your body needs to adapt. If it didn't, that would actually probably be a sign of some, uh, like kink in the system. But I think that's so, so important, dude. And, um, it, it's really cool to hear how, how successful Mexico was for y'all. Cause I think that's like, a that's not a North star, but I think that's a goal for a lot of people, a lot of young guys, um, to find that group of people that they are aligned with, that they want to be with, in an environment that's conducive for growth. And that kind of segues into my next question is like, I'm assuming you met those guys through Twitter, right? Yeah, all of them, all through Twitter. How instrumental has Twitter been for your growth as a person and as a business? Yeah, I want to backtrack a little and yeah, you yeah. say that people are always looking for that group of guys that are like minded group of guys that are also doing things. But I think where a lot of people get it wrong is that they're searching for that. Like you have, you have to really become the person that is deserving of having that circle of people around you. And you can't just keep reaching for it because, uh, I mean, by like laws of polarity, if you keep reaching for it, then it's going to gonna run away from you because you're not focusing on what, what matters. And what really matters is building yourself into that super deserving, successful person that is capable of attracting those people into your life. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. What was the question? No, that's again? crucial. Sorry. That, that, well, damn, that's a phenomenal point right there in and of itself. Like I, I just wrote that down, become the person that's so right. Because what's that old, uh, like, uh, I think it was like an example of like a swing set. It's like, okay, if I want the swing set, but I hold on to it too tight and I hold on to it and I won't let it go. Eventually my grip is going to weaken and I'm going to let it go. And then what happens? It goes as it goes farther away. And mm -hmm. then it's the same thing. Like if, if you're, um, if you push and push and seek and seek and seek, then eventually it's going to come back and hit you and then go away again. So it's, I think you're totally right. Become the person. Um, and also, I mean, from like a, a status hierarchy, which there is in society, it, it, it comes across as, as like wanting or disingenuous. And I've noticed this even from like the podcast, um, in the beginning, it's as somebody that had like zero following had zero podcast episodes, had zero reason to talk to people, like kind of figuring out a way to provide a little bit of value to a person that, that has more value um, or more status in the hierarchy than I did. 
I think it's an interesting exercise to figure out how to give value to those people, which as you're saying is to like become that person. Um, but the question was really just how, how has Twitter been instrumental to your growth as a person in, in business? Oh yeah. Twitter definitely changed my life. Um, uh, it's funny because I met Noah actually before Twitter, we didn't meet on Twitter. He's one of the reasons that I actually made my Twitter. He reached out to me because he wanted to buy my domain. He wanted to buy basechillager.com because he wanted to start a company with the same exact name as mine. And we hopped on a call. And I mean, I didn't know at the time that he was calling me to buy my domain, but uh, like months down the line, he's like, yeah, the reason I called you is because I wanted to buy your domain, but I knew you would just crush it. And uh, yeah, so I just hopped on Twitter. I connected with a few of the guys who were like the men, the, the people of health Twitter now, Noah, Newbro. Vance is blowing up right now. Um, and those guys have definitely been a huge, huge uh, inspiration to me. Huge, played like huge roles in my life. And without them, like, honestly, I don't know where I would be. Like, those are some of the, the best dudes that I've ever met. And they've just like helped me so much. Yeah, that's awesome. The The interesting thing, well, first off on the topic of Vance, dude, or even Noah too, but Vance was like the first person I had on the podcast from Twitter and he had like 700 followers. And this was mm -hmm. in, this was in July. So like to see his growth in that amount, I mean, what's he at like 13 or maybe even 15 now or something like, and, and his business growth too. It's, it's cool to, uh, it's interesting. Cause I actually, this is weird. I, I associate based in, in Meraki, like mm -hmm. sort of, uh, together because I started taking them at the same time. And it's just been so cool to see y'all's growth, both personally, like your personal brand and the actual company. Um, one thing, you know, who Brett, Ender is meet Mafia yeah, Brett. Yeah. So he he I had him and Harry on the podcast, and he was talking about how Twitter is great because it scratches that itch for community. Like you can kind of it's it's one of the biggest blessings. You can kind of cultivate the community that you're around, whereas because you have a bigger pool to choose from, and then you find your niche like esoteric health or money Twitter, whatever it is, you find your niche and you become a part of this community. You start communicating with people, you build relationships. Whereas you have a smaller pool, it's it's a lot more. There's a bigger barrier to entry in the real world because the likelihood mm -hmm. of like my neighbor that I'm looking at being into Shilajit and Pine Pond is pretty low. Um, but his point was like, you have to put your ass where your heart is, which I think is awesome. It's great advice because some people will join Twitter and then they'll just stay in the corner of the world in real life where there is none of those people bringing back the Mexico example again. And you, you move into Florida and all these things like that's the, you had the biggest jump when, when you put your ass, your actual physical body, in the environment with those people, not just over Twitter and stuff, which I think is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that I like about Twitter is that it allows super authentic brands to grow. And the followings are so tight knit that I would argue that 5k followers on Twitter is more beneficial than having 100k followers on TikTok, just because the community is so much more about the content that you're putting out because it's all information based. And in terms of like viral algorithms, like you could have one video blow up on TikTok and have your account get to like 50K followers, but those people really just don't care about your content as a whole. They just saw a viral video and ended up following you. And then they're really just like a valueless follower. But Twitter, on the other hand, it's like all those people follow you, all those people follow your content, follow the content of the people that are surrounded by you in a similar sphere, whether it's e-com, health, whatever uh, part of Twitter you're on and the, the audience is just so valuable. Yeah. The, uh, I, I think you're entirely right. And I have a, I have a theory on this that like the reason that Twitter is, is actually more of an online quote community, obviously enough. I don't think anything can replace real world connection. I think it's a tool to get to that. Um, Agreed, yeah. Yeah. The it's actually a community because how many times have you ever seen like a hundred response a uh, conversation in an Instagram video. I've literally, like, I'm talking like back and forth where like one guy's mm -hmm. like this and then this. You'll see freaking full on conversations between five people at the same time for tweet, 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 tweet down the line. And it's so much more connective in that way. And it's also, it appeals to like the intellectual part of us, not the the visual part of us, which Instagram, TikTok is much more appealing right up at the front. Like that's why you get these valueless mm -hmm. followers from it from a viral video, but then when you actually, over time, you put out good tweets, people are going to actually respect your ideas and the way you think, which is so much more trust is going to be built from that, which I think is a, 
honestly, I mean, you're probably more aware of, the, of this than I am or most people, but that's probably why base one of the reasons why it's done so well. Yeah, definitely one of the reasons why it's done so well. I'm super proud of our Twitter uh, sales channel because the audience that we have on there is probably our most receptive audience that we have across all platforms. And it, it doesn't convert like the highest numbers, obviously, because we're not spending like any sort of paid advertising on Twitter or anything. But in terms of like testing products, like asking the market what they want to see more of, like the Twitter audience on that we have on the base account is so receptive and it's so much easier to make decisions based off of people who you know actually care about the content rather than people who are just like here for one post and then they'll never see us again. Uh, that's a great point. That's, that's what I love about Twitter. Twitter is yeah, it's like a launching pad. It is. It is a launching pad. And I, I almost have it down. I, um, I almost think we have it down to being able to test any product on that page and then see what people are going to like. And then we could build off of that and then go into supply chain research and stuff. Yeah. Speak, speaking to that, like what's, uh, obviously got pond pollen reviews are about to start coming out. I'm sure they will be fantastic. Chili Jit's still cranking, going to continue to grow. What's, what's your vision for, uh, or like your next step for, for base. So we're looking way more into traditional Russian medicine, which is super interesting to us. Uh, a lot of the remedies out there are super unheard of in the West, but they're some pretty wicked vitality remedies. They have beaver caster glands, uh, deer, deer velvet extract, mm -hmm. which yeah, I'm yeah. actually researching a lot right now. Uh, hopefully going to be uh, experimenting with tincture, with uh, making a tincture for that and testing it out. Uh, white, white stone oil, which is white shilajit. Uh, mm. it is a very rare compound that's found in Russia. It's actually super expensive. It's probably why no one is drop shipping it. Yeah. <laughs> in there. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of traditional Russian medicine vitality remedies that we're looking into right now. Uh, we don't know for sure what the next product is going to be, but in 2024, definitely we're thinking of uh, expanding the product line, probably like two, three new products. But again, with the base brand, it's not like we could just choose a product and, launch it in like two weeks there's a lot that goes into it we test it ourselves we do supply chain research lab testing making sure that there's no better sourcing in the market other than where we're getting it from because that's the principle of the brand we're not going to just find a product on a wholesale website and throw a private label on it and sell it no it's like we're actually going to sit i'm actually going to sit in my kitchen and make pine pollen <laughs> macerations and test it out myself <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a it's a weeks long, months long process, but we definitely have plans of releasing more products in the future. The the deer antler thing. So as I mentioned, like I'm a hunter, and I've 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 actually heard of the first two. I've never heard of the white stone oil or whatever you said, but I've heard of people using beaver castor oil and the deer antler thing. I heard of a while, like several years ago. Um, and the the thought process behind that that's really interesting that you said that because that that they grow their entire new antlers every single year they fall off and they grow them back bigger and stronger so whatever allows them to do that it's got to be extremely powerful mm -hmm. so that, yeah it's that's like thing. it's it's a very similar principle with the pine pollen too it's like you have those phytoandrogens those growth factors that are responsible for germination of plants rapid cell division it's like that's got to interact very similarly in humans than it does in its role that it plays for the plant. And then the same thing for deer velvet. It's like those deers grow their antlers so freaking fast. There has to be some sort of compound in there that's responsible for that. Um, so a lot of people are taking like deer velvet extract for like testosterone benefits for the growth benefits because I, it's a potent source of like IGF-1 and stuff. So it's really coming down to seeing what it does in say the plant, say what it does in the deer antlers and seeing, Hey, what effect does this have in humans? Because a lot of the compounds have similar effects across multiple different species. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the pond pollen like the male part of the plant or something? Is, did I see that correctly? Yeah. It's the male sexual medium of pine trees. So it's yeah. what the, it, it's essentially, we call it pine tree sperm because it's what is, uh, impregnate it's not impregnating what is it uh i mean that's that's pretty much the, the word i would use yeah pollinating yeah pollinating it's pollinating the female pine trees so that it could produce babies uh 
So, I mean, it's a very similar principle across all different species. Yeah, and you think about a buck is a male is a is a male um, deer. So that makes sense. Uh, a question that I actually thought about regarding you, I mean, because like, dude, you, the growth of based has been like exponential, especially over the last half year or year. What's what's like the the the, the journey the last six months of entrepreneurship? What has it taught you about you? Like, what have you learned about yourself from that growth? Yeah, this is definitely an important question. Once you reach that first benchmark, because the first benchmark for a lot of people is really making that first big sum of cash where it's like, I'm comfortable now and it's really not about the money anymore. And I've kind of struggled with this personally. It's like, what do you do after you kind of break the financial goal? Um, but because at, at, at a point, like more money doesn't really affect your life any more differently. Yeah. Like I made 400 K in a month in November. It's like, I could pretty much live off that money for a couple of years and any more money that I make is really just extra income that I really have. I, I don't want to say like no use for it, but it's like the law of decreasing marginal utility. It's like the more you have, the less it affects your life. Yeah. Um, so you really need to pivot your goals and say, what's the next step? You always need to be working towards something. And once you break that money barrier, it's like, okay, what is what is my goal been this whole time? Well, it's to create these banger products and release them so that I could help change lives. And that's really where I'm at now. It's like going so hard, so much harder into research now that I have the time to do it um, because that's been the purpose since the beginning. It's to create amazing products that are uh, that have the potential to change lives. And I, it's to a point where I have all these systems set up and I have all the time to do it. So that's really the purpose now. It, that, that's a great answer. I think that's so true. Um, I have not yet experienced that, but I'm, I'm sure you're exactly right. There is a point where it's kind of like, okay, well, what the hell am I doing? Um, what, what's one thing from like an e-commerce standpoint that you, you did maybe at the beginning of base that you either A, don't do now and look back like, holy shit, that was stupid, or that you... Um, that you did then that you continue to do now? Mm, this is a tough question. Uh, so is there anything it, where you look back and you're like, fuck, like, what was I doing? I remember back in the day, the first person I hired for email marketing, he, so I kind of just gave him full reign over the Clavio account. And I was like, Hey, just create campaigns, make sure that, uh, we're putting out enough campaigns for us to convert, uh, our email list to, subscribers or like purchases and he would send me he would send me the templates for what he was about to send out he would send me the drafts and it was stupid of me to not look at them and just trust that they looked good and i remember there was this one valentine's day campaign that he sent out and it was just for, first of all it was just like a horrific design Second of all, it was so vile. I'm not going to say what the tweet was that he put in there, but it was so vile. I fired him on the spot. I literally fired him on the spot. I was like, I mean, it's completely my fault for not looking at the draft before he sent it out, but it was just so bad for the brand image. Uh, the email marketing agency that I work with now, we plan monthly campaigns. I look at all of them. I proofread them. I put my notes in, make sure they're edited to be perfect. Uh, there's always a purpose behind the emails that we send out now. But yeah, just it, it's important to if you, even if you hire people, don't just expect that they're going to do exactly what you think they're going to do. You have to make sure that you fully understand their job and oversee them still and not just give them uh, free reign because that at the time I saw that email, I was like, my business is over. This is over. <laughs> like, <laughs> you sent this to my entire email list. Like we're so fucked. But I mean, over time it, it healed. So we're chilling. Yeah. Um, so looking back, like that's one thing that I remember. I was like, fuck, that was crazy. Um, <laughs> that's a valuable lesson though to learn, especially early on. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty, yeah. I, you, you'll have to tell me what the, what the email was off air. Cause that's, that's pretty damn funny. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you uh, after this podcast. Um, but. What, what's the, what's the one or, or whatever two, or, what's one thing that you, done the whole time that you are proud that you've done and continue to do with based? Con yeah, just continuing to build off of what's working. So you could have things that work, um, but it's not to say that there's no room for improvement everywhere. So you could see if you go on like uh, 
I, I don't know what the website is where you could see old snapshots of uh, previous websites. You could see the evolution of the base website over the past two years. Back when I thought it looked good, I look back now and I was like, that looks like shit. Even if it converted like relatively well, you still want to continue building and building and building and making sure that everything looks better. Um, testing for like conversion rate optimization type stuff down to like the colorways where the buttons are, the fonts, the website design, the embedded videos that you have, like all of it plays a role in the customer journey. And you just want to continue building off of what works. Even with Facebook ads too, it's like you could have an ad that's pumping a two row ass and you could say, hey, this is great. Uh, I'm just going to keep running this forever. But you have to keep on building on what's working. So you could run that ad for maybe a month or two at that two row ass, but eventually it's going to die out because the entire market is going to see that same advertisement over and over and it's not going to resonate with people the same way. And if you didn't prepare yourself for when that ad dies, you don't have like five, 10, 20 creatives ready in the back end to start testing, then you screwed yourself because you relied too heavily on one thing and you didn't allow yourself to start testing other things that could have maybe worked twice as good. Or even if they didn't work twice as good, it's like you don't have anything else to put out to the audience because you were too lazy to test stuff and you were you got complacent with that one thing that was working. So from an e-commerce standpoint, it's like you could have things that work but you still have to keep testing things because what works today is not going to work in two weeks. And you can see it in uh, all the evolving markets too. It's like TikTok organic used to be so much easier a year ago compared to what it is now. And then all of a sudden it's like the inception of TikTok shop. Well, that wasn't a thing like three, four months ago, but now it's the biggest thing. And if you're not on TikTok shop, then you're getting left in the dust by all these other brands that hopped on it before you. Um, so it's like just being one, two steps ahead too of the curve. And I mean, things could be sunshine and rainbows right now, but if you get too used to it and then two months go by and you haven't tested anything, then you're just going to screw yourself. So it's a ever evolving game and you just got to keep moving with it. Yeah. I mean, the, it kind of goes back. I mean, we've talked about this a ton, but like your time in Mexico is a great example of, of how you stay away from that lull or that plateau or even like that, that steep decline because when you're around guys that know what they're doing and are in similar directions like we've mentioned that are good friends they're not going to just be like yeah that's a good idea when it's a real shit idea right like they're going to be like yeah mm -hmm. maybe hey, you need to rework this or hey this is working but like, hey i had this thought here's what you do here here's what you should do with this and it's that constant evolution whereas if you're in your own little uh echo chamber you don't get that feedback from people that you trust which i think is an yet another reason i guess it's like probably the the theme of this podcast is to like find or become the person that you can um, then surround yourself with those types of people, because that type of feedback is invaluable. My uh, question I just thought of what, what's like your number one sales channel? Like how, where do y'all get, is it Facebook ads, TikTok? Yeah, it's Facebook ads for sure. And I think that's with any big brand. It's like the, the most brand equity that you're going to build, the most amount of traffic that you're going to be able to bring in consistently is going to come through Facebook just because their platform, their algorithms are so well seasoned. Their platform is so big. You could reach so many new customers. So yeah, Facebook definitely. And if you ask any, any big e-commerce brand, they're probably going to say Facebook. Yeah. Here, here's a question. This is kind of actually, uh, this might be directed at myself. Um, what what is some advice that you would give somebody who's like new to the e-commerce journey like somebody that that uh i mean yeah like myself with like tyro glass for example not i'm not asking for like a therapy session but like what's some what's advice like principles that you would ask or that you would give somebody that's on that front end of the uh, of the journey find a mentor that is one or two steps ahead of you not any more than that because if you find some if you're talking with someone that doesn't understand where you are the information that they're going to share with you is just going to go straight over your head. So the importance of having a mentor that is only one or two steps ahead of you is paramount because that's the best information that you're going to get for where you're currently at. And it's important to also have a mentor, like you said before, that's not going to put you in an echo chamber and say, hey, this looks good. Hey, this looks good. You want a mentor that's going to absolutely shit on you. You want a mentor that's going to say, hey, this is an awful idea. You need to pivot this. Um, Hey, like this looks okay, but you should implement this to make it better. Um, you don't, 
you don't want a guy that's just going to say, Hey, like you're doing a great job. Like keep up the good work. It's like, no, you want feedback on every single thing, even if what you're doing is perfect. Like there's always room for improvement everywhere. That's great. Dude, that, that stems back to exactly what we were just talking about with like the quantum leaps through people. Mm-hmm. Like you could have given any piece of advice, but you're exactly right. I think that's a great, um, a great point. I actually talked with my jujitsu coach recently on the podcast and he, he's like 40 something years old, successful business owner now, three degree, third degree black belt in jujitsu. And he's like, his biggest advice is never stop having mentors. So I think that that's, uh, that's really valuable advice. I got, I got one more question. It's kind of like how I've wrapped up a lot of the podcasts that I have just because I think it's a, it's a really good insight into like you and your mission. Um, but Tyro means novice or beginner. It stems from the Latin word meaning young soldier. And in that context, it was somebody that was entering the military, like a, a, a new literal military recruit. The way that I perceive it is a Tyro is somebody that's like in an arena. Obviously, everybody's in a different arena, but they're in an arena and they're standing firm and they're fighting valiantly. So my question to you is what what arena are you in? Like, what is the the thing that you are fighting valiantly for? The thing I'm fighting valiantly for is allowing people to pursue what they want, uh, pursuing their truth, figuring out what their principles are and going about it, not caring what anyone else thinks. And that's the idea behind base too. Base is like, Hey, this is what I believe in. This is what I find true to me and I'm going to pursue it. And I don't care what you say. That's a worthy battle, dude. And I think that that's uh, inseparable from health too. So I, I, th- I don't think it's a coincidence that your brand is, is like, that's the mission, but you also uh, provide people with, with conduits for increasing their vitality because like you can't, you need vitality. You need health to be able to fight that battle. So more power to you, man. Eric, I, I appreciate your time. I want to say again, I absolutely love Bay Shilajit. Um, I need to actually get some more. And then Pine Pond, I'm stoked to uh, I'm stoked to try that and then get back to you, dude. I'm, I'm pumped for that. But where can people find you? That's another another thing. Yeah, uh, Instagram, Eric Jasper Keir. Uh, Twitter, Eric Jasper Keir. Join the broadcast channel. That's a new uh channel where I'm putting out a lot of my business advice, health advice, just lifestyle design type stuff, having a lot of fun posting on that broadcast channel. So definitely join up and yeah, just mostly Instagram and Twitter is where I'm active. And then base supplements.com check out the products there. Pine pollen. We're doing uh, monthly drops up until halfway through the year. So sign up for the email list if you want to try that product. And yeah, other than that, Nolan, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I had a great time. Had a lot of good conversation and yeah, looking forward to everything moving forward. Right on, brother. I appreciate you. For sure.